Good evening to everybody, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Uh, I'm Jennifer Robinolt, and on behalf of the College of Law and the Illinois Program on Law, Behavior, and Social Science, I want to welcome you all to Lions, Spiders, and Bears, Better Environmental Regulation Through Psychology, an, an event to celebrate the publication of the Psychology of Environmental Law by my colleagues and friends, Arden Rowell and Kenworthy Bills, both professors of law at the College of Law at the University of Illinois. Welcome everybody and thank you for being here. The psychology of environmental law is truly an accomplishment and one that we gather to celebrate today. It explores the psychological complexities of environmental issues, issues that are characterized by the diffusion of harm across time and across space, that affects targets that can be unidentifiable, members of outgroups, members of future generations, uh, and even non-human targets. Issues that involve probabilistic or uncertain effects. In their book, professors Raoul and Biltz deftly identify and explain the psychological complications that attend these characteristics and neatly use psychology to explore how law might better understand, predict, and shape the human behaviors that affect the environment. The book has been described as groundbreaking and as a landmark work. And we at the college offer our heartfelt congratulations to Arden and Kenworthy for their accomplishment. We are delighted today to be joined by three distinguished panelists, Hajin Kim, Richard Lazarus, and Tom Yulin. And as our time together is short and we want to spend most of it hearing from them and hearing about the book and hearing from the authors and the questions that you all have, a lot to accomplish in just an hour, I want to very briefly introduce the panel members to you. So first we will hear from Hajin Kim, who is an assistant professor of law at the University of Chicago. Professor Kim is a JD PhD, having earned her PhD from Stanford's Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources, in addition to her JD from Stanford. She uses principles from social psychology and economics to study environmental law, examining in particular how moral and social influence can shape environmental regulation and firm behavior. She will be followed by Richard Lazarus, Professor Lazarus is the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law at Harvard University, where he teaches and writes about environmental and natural resources law with particular emphasis on constitutional law and the Supreme Court. And in that vein, he has represented the US, state and lo local governments and environmental groups in many cases before the US Supreme Court. And I can't let it go unremarked that Professor Lazarus was born here in Champaign-Urbana at Carl Hospital, grew up here, and also received his undergraduate degrees in chemistry and economics from the University of Illinois. Richard, we hope to be able to have you back here to campus in person sometime in the, in the near future. And finally, we will hear from my friend and colleague and co-author Tom Eulin. Professor Eulin is the Swanland Chair Emeritus at the University of Illinois and the founding director of the program in law and economics, which has now become the Illinois program in law, behavior and social science. As a PhD economist, Tom's scholarship focuses on economics, legal scholarship, and legal education. And his textbook on law and economics, co-authored with Bob Cooter, helped to frame the field of law and economics and has introduced many, many, many students to the field of law and economics. There is much more that I could say about each of them, but because we're so looking forward to hearing from them, I think we should get started. We hope to have some question and answer time later in the hour. So if you have questions as we proceed, uh, feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat box. And with that, I turn the floor over to Professor Kim. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I am so delighted to be here to talk about this really impressive work. Um, I think it's difficult, just coming from, I do, this is my field, environmental law and psychology, and I know that there is an uphill battle in this field because there is this, assu this assumption that, well, what does psychology have to do with environmental law? Most of the regulated entities are firms. We think firms are still perfectly rational. We know that's not true, of course, but, you know, there is this, this, um, 
type of type of belief. And I think the book did such a nice job of laying out, you know, how regulators, regulated entities, interested parties, so many of, of these entities are all individuals or made up of Sorry, I got muted somehow. Um, subject to psychological influence and bias, um, and 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 it's also it's also really um, impressive because the book is you know environmental law is this incredibly you know rich and unwieldy do like set of doctrines, and so to cover so much of environmental law and so much of the really deep literature um, on how. Um, psychology affects regulated uh, regulation and behavior is it's just it's, it's really impressive. Um, but because this is my field, I wanted to talk about more particularly, um, well, one, um, I'm selfishly so glad I have this resource now. Um, but two, like the reason part of the reason I'm so glad is because the book really helped highlight a blind spot that I have um, in the field. And so I, I thought that might be um, um, it might be interesting. So the blind spot has to do with reference points which the book explains super nicely in chapter two, right? So reference points help us code changes in status as loss or a gain. So we can of course play with how we frame that change in status. Uh, you could frame pollution mitigation as a loss, as extra effort required that differs from, from business as usual. Or you can frame the degradation from pollution that would, would result without the mitigation as a loss from status quo from the, from the less polluted environment. So the way so reference points are incredibly important in how we how we think about in, in, in our motivations and how we think about um, the types of actions we're, we're willing to take. Um, and I realized I came to psychology with economics as my reference point. That's what I studied in college. And economics, as it relates to environmental externalities, is truly the dismal science, right? So we assume that people are perfectly rational, but also inherently self-interested. <clears throat> But in psychology we, and behavioral economics, we learned that, well, actually people are altruistic to a certain degree, they're subject to social influence, they care about their moral identities, they want to think of themselves as moral actors. And so for me, coming into psychology and environmental law, I, I really thought of psychology as this reason for hope, this discipline as a reason to, for optimism for what we can achieve. Um, and you know, there's, there's plenty of examples. Um, so uh, in the book, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, Cialdini and persuasion tactics. So one of my favorites um, is, you know, just the, the use of descriptive norms. So telling, um, you know, putting on electricity bills that you are using less, le uh, more electricity than your neighbor, suddenly people will say, oh, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a bad actress. And then they'll start conserving electricity. And what's really funny is for the people who are actually conserving and doing a better job than their neighbors, at first, telling them that seemed to cause them to, you know, conserve less because they they already thought, oh, I'm I'm such a good actor. But then people just put smiley faces on the electricity bills, and that made, you know, the the that made people to continue to conserve. So so that type of example is just, you know, it's it's um it's really uplifting. Like, oh, you know, we can uh, we can think about how to change hum like seemingly intractable human behavior with with some of these nudges, right? Um, but the book also showed me that my reference point was just that, a reference point. So um, I think the implicit reference point in the book is uh, perfect regulation, which I think is a, is a wonderful reference point. And the, the real example that sticks out to me is listing decisions in the Endangered Species Act. So I always thought the fact that um, people are drawn to charismatic megafauna, so the larger, more, more photogenic species, the book goes through how those are basically the species that we <clears throat> we protect because you know people those are the species that that people get excited about they're they're excited about the northern spotted owl they're not excited about you know the um Delhi sands loving fly although that is listed actually um but you know there it's you, people tend to care less about uh, about these um these just like less beautiful creatures so to me coming from economics as my reference point I actually thought this was a wonderful thing because a perfectly rational, self-interested, homo economicus person might not care that much about spotted owls at all. But because we're people with, with quirky psychologies who like cute, fuzzy 
animals, like suddenly we have a lever to help protect and conserve some of the environment. And, you know, we, we ended up protecting quite a, quite a bit of the Pacific Northwest because of spotted owls, right? Um, but this is exactly where I saw that my reference point was really just a reference point because Arden and Kenworth they explain like this, this is also quite underprotective um, because their reference point is perfect regulation to truly achieve the objectives of the statute, right? And so we have, you know, insects are just, we're, we're facing a devastating loss of insects and people just don't care. Um, people may care in the sort of homo economicus way of like, well, some of the insects that we're losing are pollinators and we need those pollinators. So like what instrumental value do they have for us? But there's less intrinsic value placed in these, these insects. Um, and so that, that was really um, like eye-opening for me to think about it. Oh, what if I actually even think about from a more, more protective uh, reference point? So the other thing because of this reference point that was striking to me from this book was where psychology suggests that we are in fact worse off because of our biases where um, we might be better if we were in fact self-interested actors. And by better, I mean, we might have more stronger environmental protections if we were better, like more self-interested actors. Um, so some of it is where we just waste resources. So there's that very colorful example of the um, reservoir in Oregon that they drained because a teenager had peed into it. Um, and it seems in some ways quite silly because surely there's much larger quantities of animal pee in that re reservoir. It's an open air reservoir, uh, but you know, um, it somehow seemed like much less, like uh, I think the book talks about it as unnatural or more, much more like a pollutant um, because it was a teenager deliberately peeing into it. Um, so some of that, like, you know, maybe if we were truly homo economicus and, and we, we, would, we would not do that, uh, we would not waste resources that way. Um, but other things, you know, like the hometown pollution effect that they discuss, where we um, think that like familiar sources of risk and pollution are not as bad because they are familiar um, as they may be, or um, psychic numbing, where we just, the potential harms from climate change and other uh, disasters might just seem too hard for us to to comprehend and so we sort of just pushed aside and don't think about it. These are areas where really psychology teaches us that, um, or psychology, it, uh, I guess, illuminates, um, you know, maybe in these instances, we, we, we like, it would be better if we um, were less uh, emotional creatures in some ways. Um, so I could go on and on. I learned so much from this book, but I know my time is limited. Um, and so I, I guess I just want to end on the um, what the the I guess big lesson I learned or I took away from this book is really the title of this session. Um, I mean, the bears and spiders is 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 adorable, but really the the part where like I, I think the book is a fantastic resource because what it does is it helps us really think about how to improve environmental regulation. Um, so it really like both in the ways where psychology is helpful to us, we protect charismatic megafauna and where it might hurt us. And so, so thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful resource. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lazarus. Yes, uh, thanks, Jen. Uh, I'm really delighted to join everyone that celebrate this uh, terrific new book uh, by Arden and, and Kenworthy. Uh, a book of this nature is worthy of celebration any place and any time. Uh, but as Jen pointed out, I take special joy uh, that both of them on the U of I uh, law faculty. Uh, in June 1972, that's a while ago, uh, I had just completed my freshman year at the U of I, um, having, as Jen said, my hometown, having been born at Lilly on Carl Hospital uh, on University. Uh, I went to U of I immediately after graduating from Uni High, that's what's behind me right now, uh, on Springfield Avenue. Uh, I was 16 years old when I was headed to Illinois. I looked about 14 years old. Uh, and being a typical uni high grad, I thought I, I was pretty old. Um, I, and I decided I better determine what I wanted to do um, in life. And I decided then, actually by age 17, the end of freshman year, I decided on environmental law. Um, the problem was it wasn't at all clear what I should study uh, as an undergraduate uh, at U of I. Uh, there was back then, not surprisingly, no environmental studies program. EPA had just been created a little before that. Clean Water Act had not yet been passed. Um, the AIR Act had just been passed, NEPA had just been passed. There was nothing called environmental science. There was no environmental policy studies, no environmental political science class. 
The U of I had just then offered its first environmental law class. That was by Roger Finley, uh, who taught it in 1970-71. I confirmed that uh, with Roger uh, by email uh, this morning. That was the first year that, that it was taught. Um, so how did I choose what to study? I really picked up U of I course catalog. They had a book back then called the course catalog. Uh, and I flipped through it. Um, and when I got to the C's, I came across a class, an advanced chemistry class called environmental chemistry uh, taught by Dr. David Natouche. And then I kept, kept flipping and I got uh, to the E's and I noticed an advanced economics class uh, called environmental economics uh, taught by then U of I professor Julian Simon. Uh, I went through the entire book and that was it. Uh, so I decided I would get two degrees in Illinois, a uh, BS in chemistry uh, and a BA in economics. Uh, 50 years later, I now realize, right, I should have gotten a degree in psychology uh, and not uh, in those other uh, two things. Now, I, I say that somewhat in jest, uh, but not entirely. Uh, on my very first day of teaching environmental law, that was at Indiana University, the rival uh, down the highway, not University of Illinois, but I should point out that's because they didn't hire me. Uh, I interviewed and you guys turned me down, but you traded up. Because you, you, you hired Eric Freifogel, who is a, a treasure uh, and just a fabulous uh, scholar. Uh, but that my very first day of teaching at Indiana in uh, August 83, I, you can look, I can look at my notes and you can see them. I could show them on PowerPoint. Uh, the very first thing I wrote at the top of my notes is what is environmental about environmental law? Uh, and that's the same question I've been striving to answer ever since uh, in my scholarship. Uh, to what extent environmental law is the context uh, for the application of other areas of law, um, torts, property, civil procedure, constitutional law, criminal law, uh, civil rights law, or to what extent there's something distinct about environmental law? It's an important question, not just for me to ask, but it's also an important question for all of our students interested in becoming environmental lawyers to consider. Uh, should they take more and more specialized environmental law classes? Uh, or should they just instead focus on becoming the best possible lawyer uh, and then apply those skills uh, to address environmental issues wherever they arise? Uh, perhaps because I'm a law professor uh, and no question is a simple binary answer, my answer to my own question is both, uh, not yes or no, uh, but yes uh, and no. Uh, first, uh, the best environmental lawyers are actually the best lawyers. Uh, if you want to be an environmental lawyer, make for sure the first thing you do to become an outstanding uh, lawyer, uh, capable of mastering whatever legal issues or legal advocacy skills are needed to address a dispute where the environmental stakes are high, endangered species, water, air, climate change, uh, whatever. But then, even then, there's something distinct about environmental law. And the best environmental lawyers, they know that. They know they need to appreciate uh, that too. So they understand why environmental law looks the way it does, and how environmental law necessarily re reflects the challenges of environmental lawmaking. So what makes it especially challenging to make environmental law in the instance, in the first instance, uh, maintain and enforce it over time? In answering that question in my own scholarship, um, I focused on three factors. Um, uh, the shorthand is laws of nature, natures of lawmaking institutions, uh, and human nature. Uh, and how these factors in combination make environmental law uh, so hard. First, uh, the laws of nature spread cause and effect out over time and space, and therefore make it highly diffuse and highly complex. Uh, second, our lawmaking institutions struggle to address problems uh, when cause and effect are spread out uh, over time and space, because it requires regulating people uh, here and now for the benefit of people uh, there and then. Uh, that's hard for any lawmaking institution to do. It's really hard for all lawmaking institutions to do. Uh, given the nature of our political process, how we elect people on short-term uh, cycles, uh, how fragmented we, we uh, how much we fragment our government authority horizontally, horizontally and vertically, um, and how our constitution makes it doubly hard to pass sweeping redistributive laws. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's just really hard to fit for environmental law. And finally, human nature, uh, the cognitive limits on human mental processes and how they prompt overassessment of some risks, underestimations, of others and how laws of nature then obscure those risks. So what Arden and Kenworthy have done with this book is they no less than blow up this last category. 
uh, before the human nature inquiry, for those of us who thought about it, has been little more than just a hodgepodge uh, of factors like myopia, availability heuristic, and the like. Uh, much of it derived from cognitive behavioral economics. Uh, what their book really brilliantly does is add enormous amount of analytical uh, rigor and depth to the role of human nature. Uh, when I do research, I do scorched earth research. But this book is the equivalent of finding a treasure trove. Uh, of ideas uh, in the field of psychology uh, more often than any of the rest of us been doing environmental law have thought about uh, before. Uh, the book, of course, builds upon the work of two brilliant psychologists, uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, and Ava Tversky. Uh, they identified the mountaintop uh, years ago here. But with what they've done, what Arlen and uh, Arden and Kenworthy have done now is revealed all the depth and breadth beneath that uh, mountaintop. An application of environmental law generally at sort of the bottom, an application to pollution control on one side and natural resource management law on the other side, an application to wildlife endangered species, uh, you know, forests, um, uh, parks, and of course, to the issue of our time, uh, climate change. Uh, my favorite part of the book uh, are chapters two and three. Uh, when I wrote The Making of Environmental Law uh, 20 years ago, um, I thought long and hard about what made environmental law distinctively challenging. Uh, and I focused, I mentioned before, on how it spread out cause and effect over time and space and why that was really hard lawmaking institutions and human nature. But what chapter two does is it takes two of the focal points of my book, uh, which were diffusion and complexity, and it just fills out all the details uh, for human uh, nature. It goes to town uh, on uh, human psychology, in a very highly sophisticated uh, and thoughtful way. I thought I knew something about a bunch of the ideas uh, beforehand, but really in rough form, uh, very much an outline. Uh, the book does the equivalent of adding pixel density, uh, sort of an order of magnitude pixel density and making clear all the different um, uh, nuances uh, to human nature, which I called it, and now they call the psychology of environmental law. Uh, the most sobering part of the book is, of course, chapter eight, uh, and that's applying the insights of psychology to the problem addressing global climate change, underscoring why it's so hard uh, for us to address the climate change issue, uh, and just why it's so intractable. Um, you can see it uh, in how effectively former President Trump, and I take great joy in saying former President Trump, uh, knowingly or not, how he exploited those same psychological features of climate change to his political advantage over four years. How he took advantage of climate change extraordinary magnitude. Uh, how the book explains how threats of such magnitude can cause, as Hassin said, uh, can cause people to become numb uh, and favor denial. Uh, and he used that to his advantage. He trapped into that psych. He tapped into that psychological tendency, um, and he called it a hoax, uh, notwithstanding the science. And people, a lot of people were willing to, to buy into it uh, as a result. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, Trump took advantage of climate change's uh, diffuse nature, um, which means, as the book explains, the lack of identifiable victims uh, of climate change. I know people tend to be empathize, empathize and take action, avoid injury to identifiable victims, um, and they had none, and Trump knew that. It's hard to persuade people uh, to do less driving, uh, or turn the lights on uh, less often. Uh, by convincing that they do more, they're gonna cause famine or massive migration in other parts of the globe thousands of miles away and decades uh, from now. Uh, but even worse, uh, I think Trump, Trump was a champion of another thing the book discusses with climate change. He was a champion of turning the tables and that was convincing coal miners they were the victims here. The people wanted to buy bigger cars uh, that they were the victims here, and that addressing global climate change would mean denial to them of their lives uh, and their livelihoods. Uh, the Paris Climate Accord, according to Trump, was ceding sovereignty uh, over the people of West Virginia uh, to people in France and other parts of the world. Uh, this is where this is where I think the book is also most hopeful, and it taps into something Hajin pointed out, uh, and that is. Only by truly understanding human psychology and environmental law can we more effectively address these challenges. How to meet the psychological challenges presented by global climate change, uh, by complexity 
uh, and by its diffuse nature. Uh, you cannot ignore the science of climate change and fashion climate change laws. Uh, you cannot ignore uh, the nature of our lawmaking institutions in fashion. And now the book teaches you simply cannot afford to ignore human psychology either. It was a real joy to read. Thanks. Thank you so much. Tom Ulin. Thanks, Jen. Uh, I want to, to begin by thanking Arden and Kenworthy for inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this panel uh, and uh, so pleased to be able to talk about the scholarly work of two of my favorite colleagues. Most of what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes or so uh, is an elaboration on this one thought. What a marvelous book. Arden and Kenworthy have made an irrefutable case that one must pay close attention to psychological uh, concepts when discussing environmental law and policy. This book should become part of the go-to toolkit of every environmental scholar and policymaker, just as I want to add Jen's book with Valerie Hans on the psychology of tort law should be. Uh, I'll proceed by first making a, uh, some general remarks about the structure of the book and about and, and just a few of the, the many useful concepts articulated there. Uh, then I'm going to turn to the really vexing issue discussed in chapter eight of climate change, uh, which I think of as the example of all of the concepts discussed in this ex excellent treatise. Uh, I'll conclude with some suggestions for further work. First, the general remarks. Uh, among the many things to admire about the psychology of environmental law is its clear writing, its end of chapter summaries, and its organization. Arden and Kenworthy organize each chapter's discussion around Richie Lazarus's three distinctive characteristics of environmental law. One, that environmental law deals with matters that are diffused across time uh, and space. Uh, as an example of diffusion over time, consider that exposure to asbestos at time zero may manifest harm only at time 20 and beyond. Uh, as an example of diffusion over space, note that CO2 emitted in China on Monday can be tagged there and identified in Los Angeles one week later. Two, that the subject matter of this area of the law is complex. Identifying the cause and effect relationships in environmental harms can be extremely complex. There are intervening causes, delayed effects, and baffling chemical and meteorological processes that must be considered. These complexities defy the abilities of a single academic discipline. They require collaboration across disciplinary boundaries. Three, that environmental harms typically but not exclusively involve non-human harms. When humans or their property are injured by someone's acts or omissions, we all recognize that there may be a case for compensation and regulation. But when the injury is something non-human like the air we breathe or the diversity of non-human species or causes, quote, endangerment to a species survival, unquote. We need to make a case that those injuries compel our attention and some sort of legal remedy. These are weighty and confounding matters. The authors devote a full chapter to the psychological issues that arise with each of these three concepts. Those chapters set the stage for the following chapters, which apply the psychological aspects of diffusion, complexity, and non-human harm to specific areas of environmental law. Let me make one more general remark before, before turning to the specific issue of climate change. I want to commend Arden and uh, Kenworthy for advancing an extremely interesting academic project in which I think that the University of Illinois College of Law has long had a leading role. That is, the fostering of multidisciplinary approaches to legal issues. At one point in the recent past, 
we had 13 of 39 faculty members who, in addition to law degrees, uh, had advanced degrees in contiguous disciplines such as philosophy, political science, history, economics, psychology, and electrical and computer engineering. Happily, none of the practitioners of these disciplines felt that his or her disciplinary perspective was superior to any other. Rather, they all felt that each discipline had something important to contribute to our understanding of law. They worked and wrote together to demonstrate the value of a multi multidisciplinary role uh, approach. And very importantly, they fostered an emphasis on empirical research and exploring the law. Arden and Kenworthy's book may focus on psychology, but it also tips its cap to economics, philosophy, and other disciplines. I was particularly struck by the sophistication of their discussion of such economic issues as the tragedy of the commons, discounting future values to present values, uh, empirical techniques, and cost-benefit analysis, of which they implicitly approve in the same way that Winston Churchill approved of democracy. It's better than all the other methods of evaluation that have been tried from time to time. As a result of their wide lens approach, Arden and Kenworthy make a case not just for the importance of psychology, in looking at environmental law, but also for bringing social science, philo philosophical and other disciplines to bear. Let me turn now to climate change. About 15 years ago, I put together and taught for several years, a course on the law and economics of climate change. As all of you know, teaching is a spectacular means of learning for the teacher. I learned a lot about climate change. I'll reserve one important lesson I learned for my concluding remarks. What I now realize that I learned is that what Arden and Kenworthy say about the psychology of climate change and climate policy is precisely correct. Climate change is a vexing and contested topic for all the reasons that they stress. The effects of climate alterations are diffuse in time and space. The effects of warming are difficult to see today. They will eventuate in decades hence and disparately uh, around the world. Many countries will bear significant costs, while a few, like Russia, will reap benefits in the form of an increase in arable land. As a result of these distant and disparate effects, it is extremely hard to get politicians today to care. As uh, why would they want to inflict costs on their constituents today? for the benefit of unknown voters decades hence. And how are we supposed to get the 200 different nations of the world to agree on a comprehensive plan to address climate change? To point out just one difficulty, how do we persuade the developing countries of the world to slow down their growth by, for example, using less of the cheapest fuel on earth, coal? They quite rightly say, that the developed world generated the harms of climate change over the past 200 years. And now that those countries are rich, they can't haul up the ladder and forbid the remaining five plus billion people on the planet to forego growth. These are troubling and complex issues. The wonder is not that there is no comprehensive climate change policy among nations, but that there is any. Finally, I want to conclude with one last observation and a general plea. And I want to preface this <clears throat> by saying that I am making these observations and pleas because of the extraordinary power of Arden and Kenworthy's book. As I read it, I thought to myself how extraordinarily important to humanity it is to have places like this great university. In this community, we foster and disseminate to our students and to other scholars original thought about imp important topics, like how to think about the environment, how to build a consensus for protecting the environment, and how to regulate the uses of the environment and for what purposes. We do this in a manner that I think we would do well to stop and think about. Particularly, I want to stress how incredibly rare our community is in human affairs. We are all about excellence. 
We hire and promote on that basis. We value what we and others, including our students do on that basis. And here's the really important thing as illustrated by this book. We live and work in a community where minds are changed by rational argumentation. Do we realize how rare that is? Arden and Kenworthy cite lots of evidence that persuasion, even on the basis of objective truth, is difficult. One thing we know about the academy is that anyone in the academy who falsifies data, who tells a lie, becomes an instant pariah. By contrast, as Richie has indicated, outside the academy, you can not only lie with apparent impunity, you can get people to give you millions of dollars and attract 74 million votes. Indeed, you can persuade a lot of other people to adopt lying as a comprehensive strategy for worldly success. Why is it that only 11% of Republicans, those who self-identify as Republicans, believe that climate change is real? As, early, as late as 2000, Democrats and Republicans agreed that climate change was a real issue. What's happened? Why is it that only three Republican senators could bring themselves to vote to repeal President Trump's disastrous abandonment of methane regulations, given that methane is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases? Let me conclude by returning to the climate change class I taught many years ago. Those classes typically had a mix of environmental enthusiasts, those who were neutral on the environment but open to persuasive information, and a group of rock hard conservatives who thought that the world had too much regulation already. After 14 weeks of three hour per week lectures and looking at the evidence and talking about it among ourselves, we were all within a much narrower band. Everyone recognized that there was a significant problem, that solving that problem was difficult, that the sooner we began the better, and that certain ways of dealing with climate change, such as a carbon tax, made a great deal of sense. Obviously, we can't subject millions of people to attend 14-week classes on environmental issues to build a public consensus. But what can we do? I want to urge Arden and Kenworthy to think further about how we can use the values and talents of the academy to persuade others, not just the choir, of other academics to think about the environment as they have so brilliantly shown us. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So next uh, I will offer Kenworthy and Arden a chance to briefly respond before we turn it over to questions. We failed to coordinate this, uh, Kenworthy, and uh, oh. yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I often think that the alphabetical order doesn't actually help uh, since, uh, since, of course, my first name goes first. But um, I'll take a quick stab uh, and then, um, I don't know, interrupt me, Kenworthy, if I, if I start going too far afield. Um, so mostly I just want to say thank you all so much. Um, I'm, I, I'm so touched that you took the time to, uh, to put together such thoughtful and, uh, and provocative comments. I love the directions that you've given us for further work um, and also the perspective that each of you have have placed um, uh, placed on the book. You know, it gives me a new way of thinking, uh, new ways of thinking about the book um, as well. I guess substantively, um, I think each of you mentioned something that for me was one of the core challenges of the project, um, which was uh, this question of, uh, of whether we would take a normative stance in the book um, about what it is that environmental law should be doing um, and, and uh, sort of pushing environmental law in that direction or not. And the choice that we made in the book, which I, I, I feel pretty good about, <laughs> but the choice that we made in the book was um, to purposefully treat psychology as a tool, a largely normatively empty tool that can be used to promote a variety of different policy ends. And those include what I would might 
personally think of as bad ends. That is, the tools that we're trying to identify um, for, uh, for shaping environmental law and policy with psychology can be used for good or ill. And, um, and so to the extent that I still have some um, uh, some discomfort uh, with our choice. It's it's because I know that that we have put out into the world um, as something which um, I, uh, which uh, while um, I, while I, you know, I'm happy to hear that it's been been helpful um, in some ways um, also has the potential for uh, for pushing in what I would consider to be bad directions. So anyway, I um, I, I that's the kind of ongoing puzzle that I myself have um, uh, with this project. It's the kind of thing that I continue to, to think through um, and, uh, and I just appreciate uh, the, the, the perspective and the comments of each of you and thank you very much. So I'll add on um, you know, to the list of, of thanks in, including to Hajin, um, Tom and Richard, which thank you so, so much for the time that you spent coming up with such uh, terrific comments, but also, of course, to the Center for Behavioral and Social Science and Jennifer Robin Alt and Bob Lawless for organizing this. Um, and thank you to so many friends and family. It's very exciting that our family actually gets to, you know, because my family still doesn't think I have a real job. So this is, you know, maybe doing some job to, and I kind of don't. <laughs> It's like crazy how good my job is, but they get to see, uh, you know, what I do all day and that's nice. Um, thank you too to, you know, both current, but especially um, uh, past students and alums. It's so nice to see you here. Um, and most especially to Arden, Arden, Arden. This book would not have happened without Bar Arden. She is the one who conceived of it, um, uh, uh, invited me to help her write it. And um, it has been, you know, since my dissertation in, in, uh, in grad school, the most satisfying um, academic kind of, I don't know, enterprise I've ever engaged in. So um, the theme that I actually heard through the, uh, the speakers is one that I've been struggling with. And I'm, I, I like the way um, Hajun started, which is to say, um, you know, I, I was, I'm not sure whether to be an optimist or a pessimist when it comes to the environment. Um, and is psychology a reason to be an optimist or a pessimist? And it kind of depends um, if your baseline is that um, there's no good reason to you know, get people convinced that the environment is, is worth or able to be protected, um, uh, then psychology is quite hopeful because people care more than we would predict. Um, and there are ways to regulate in ways that um, defy a lot of um, you know, kind of self-interest. But of course, um, the other possibility as, as um, Hajin pointed out is that you know, our baseline is a world with perfect environmental re regulation where everybody cares sufficiently about the environment. Um, and if that's your baseline, then psychology gives us lots of reason to be pessimistic. Um, and as I wrote this book, um, it's funny because I think I, I started uh, probably because I am not an environmental lawyer, I'm a psychologist. I actually started with the illusion of, you know, the possibility of, of kind of perfect regulation and then just depressed myself week after week as I wrote it, thinking of all the ways that humans um, uh, fail to care adequately um, about the environment. Um, and Richard kind of added another reason for me to be nervous, which is that he said, um, you know, interestingly, you know, he took it as a reason to be optimistic that, hey, there's this recipe for how to get people to care. Um, but ironically, the recipe that we supplied is also a good recipe for getting people not to care. So, uh, you know, psychological techniques can both um, improve, you know, our ability to communicate and persuade, um, but they can also, you know, kind of be techniques for uh, deceiving people and lying to people or even just thwarting um, their desires. Um, so, you know, that's kind of depressing. Um, and then Tom asks basically, uh, you know, will persuasion work? Um, so we have this, uh, you know, tool book now, this kit. Um, and, you know, again, he's kind of coming at it from the direction, I think he's like me, he feels, you know, just the, you ended with a pretty conflicted, you know, sense of, and, and he and I sat on his porch for about an hour, kind of trying to decide whether we should be depressed or um, optimistic about um, the environment. 
And, um, you know, I, I'm still not sure, uh, you know, I think that in a way that's great. If you're an optimist, this, you know, this book will give you some well needed, uh, um, you know, kind of tempering of your, of your rose colored glasses. And if you're a pessimist, maybe this will make you feel a little less depressed. At any rate, I can tell you that the book will make fantastic Christmas and birthday gifts. Um, so uh, thank you guys so much for being here. So let, let me jump in. So I'm, I'm Bob Wallace, I'm uh, co-director of the Program on Law, Behavior, and Social Science. And it's my uh, task here to kind of moderate the question. So if you've got a question, please please put it in the chat. Um, thank you everyone for, for those uh, wonderful remarks. Um, Arden, I was, as you were commenting, I was thinking once I got called a normative nihilist. So you gotta own it. <laughs> um, so uh, Richard, uh, I think maybe you wanted to add a comment on that. Yeah. Paul in the queue, and then, and as I said, other people just leave uh, something in the chat, and I'll get you get you uh, involved. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, three quick comments. One, I want to thank Tom for referring to me as Richie Lazarus. That's what I know. I'm back home uh, when someone knows that's my Urbana my Urbana name. Um, uh, Arden, um, I want to commend you for the choice you and Kenworthy made uh, to not make this an adversarial uh, book. Um, we, I, I myself wear two hats. I think environmental law scholarship is, as a general matter, weakened and far weaker than it should be uh, because too many environmental law professors turn it into advocacy documents. Uh, and as a result, they're not really thoughtful and rigorous in their analysis. Uh, so I really appreciate it. I wear an advocacy hat too um, in other work when I do those briefs. But when, you, when you're doing an environmental scholarship, I think it really helps. And the field would be stronger if more people made the choice that you and Ken Worthy uh, May. Uh, Ken Worthy, um, I, I tell you, those of us who've been doing this stuff for a long time, uh, that's why if you look at the walls in our law offices for environmental law professors, you see dents in the wall. That's because we bang our heads against that all the time. We've been doing that for decades when we think about climate change and just how unbelievably hard it is for all the reasons that Tom gave. But believe me, if you don't start looking, being optimistic, you're not going to last long. Uh, you got you to keep pushing. Uh, you got to keep arguing. There's a lot to be pessimistic about, a lot of real empirical evidence out there, uh, but there's still time uh, and there's still reason uh, for hope. So thank you. So Paul Heal, you, you uh, have a question. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, Jen and, and Bob for putting this together and for the, the comments. It's been really uh, a lot of fun. Um, I just had a comment that builds on what really everybody has said in describing the book as providing sort of a, a toolkit and uh, displaying a methodology in depth, which, uh, as Arden said, could be used for good or could be used for uh, for evil. And, and of course, that's true of most methodologies. If we think of you know history as a methodology used by by con lawyers, it often uh, con law lawyers it often cuts in in both directions. Uh, empirical work, um, you know, you have to take the bitter with with the sweet when you adopt met that methodology too. And of course, the same same is true in economics. But it strikes me that economics is a little bit different. It, it's more than just a methodology. If you're a utilitarian, as most economists are, and and really believe that there is a normative endpoint uh, to which you should apply your, your methodology. And that's you know, greatest good for the greatest number or efficiency or, or however you want to, to label it. I'm just wondering if, if the, the bottom line in your book is an endorsement of uh, utilitarianism as maybe the only, only workable endpoint to which you can cabin and constrain your methodology or, or is there something, uh, something else that, that, you wanna, that you wanna justify and that you want to uh, adopt and endorse. So thank you, Paul. I thanks so much for that question. Um, I think it was important to both of us that the book not endorse anything, even uh, even as, as broad as just utilitarianism generally. Um, in fact, we really wanted this to be basically a, a friendly book that utilitarians could read and feel like uh, they were getting something from, um, and uh, and also non-utilitarians could read and um, and get something from. Um, so the book is purposefully, and in some cases for, for me, painfully non-utilitarian, 
Um, I, even though we do try to comment on, um, you know, where there are psychological implications, for example, in debates that, of course, highly relevant to utilitarian frameworks like cost benefit analysis. Um, I am personally, um, I sort of my, um, my heart is utilitarian. Um, if, if that, if that, um, if I could say, if I could say it that way, I think that's, I think that's the closest I could get uh, to, to, um, to putting my own um, uh, normative uh, position out there. Um, but um, I don't think that the book would persuade anyone to become a utilitarian who was not already. And I think that the closest thing that the book gets to utilitarianism is, um, is, is emphasizing the importance of effectiveness, um, which I, I feel like is a, a kind of virtue that utilitarians like, but it's not only utilitarians who like things that are effective. Um, so, um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think the book can be used uh, to promote a utilitarian viewpoint. Um, but um, but it's at least it's at least friendly um, uh, to, uh, to to those who already have one. And I think I'll add that um, in my heart, I am monumentally not a utilitarian. So it's actually probably good that we both wrote this um, book. So uh, one of the things that we write quite a bit about in the book is, um, you know, kind of the ways people value the environment that really defy utilitarianism. Um, uh, and, you know, they, them, you know, sacred values are things that are very hard to kind of boil down into any kind of, um, you know, utilitarian metric that can be easily traded off. Um, people don't treat the environment uh, from a utilitarian perspective. They have a very hard time, um, you know, making, uh, you know, trade-offs and valuing things in a way that um, a utilitarian would expect them to value it. Um, and so that's, you uh, you know, that, that's a kind of an important feature of the book that uh, we do talk a lot about cognitive biases and errors and um, Rich, Richie, may I, um, <laughs> talked about the, uh, you know, uh, the list of, of kind of, you know, it's not a list, but we, we go into great depth about how cognitive biases can affect people's um, thinking. But we also suggest that those aren't always errors. Things that look like errors to a um, maybe a traditional economist um, are not errors if you have a different attitude or, or understanding of what people value and how they value it. So um, anyway, I, I, I will agree with Arden for sure that hopefully this book is friendly to all comers, um, utilitarians and non-utilitarians alike. I've never been too sure about utilitarianism, but the upsides seem better than the downsides. Um, <laughs> so I had a question. So, you know, I read these stories about, um, you know, that the, you walk in Miami, apparently in parts of Miami, and there's water on the streets from rising sea levels. I read, you know, read stories about barrier islands doing, taking um, precautions or having to, you know, move houses, move buildings. So you're just seeing just more and more stories um, about effects happening now. And I guess it was what I was wondering about, you thought a lot about this, is you see these sort of stories, and I guess I keep going back to the, the, the photo I saw of a street in Miami that had about you know three inches of water on it from rising sea levels. Just, and we thought about this a lot, I, I'd be interested in kind of your, your perspective on kind of the, the crystal ball. So is this gonna change? Like, where's that gonna go, right? The, the fact that people are seeing this right now how rapid is that change going to be? How do you expect that to see that manifest itself in regulatory developments? If so, kind of what would those be? So it's kind of a broad question, but I was just kind of wanting you to kind of think about what we're seeing right now, what some people are experiencing right now and how that might manifest itself in concrete legal changes. Yeah, so a, a kind of simple um, prediction would be as people see the harms of um, environmental, you know, kind of damage as they start affecting them personally um, or their property or people they love, they should care about it more and they should, you know, kind of fight to regulate it more. Um, one of the messages of the book is that it, you know, would that it were so simple. 
um, it's not. So, you know, sometimes people will have sort of um, reactance in response to uh, environmental damage. Um, if they think that they've caused it, that might cause them to actually underplay the magnitude of the damage because they don't like to think of themselves as bad people. Um, you know, salience is something that's highly contextual. It kind of depends on, you know, what else is on their radar. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, Tom pointed out that, you know, and, and, you know, the, the, well, you didn't say, but uh, you all know that the um, early environmental um, regulations, big pieces of, of legislation that were passed were absolutely bipartisan. I mean, a lot of them were, uh, you know, kind of um, passed under the Nixon administration, right, a Republican administration. Um, and even as recently as, you know, 2000, there wasn't quite the partisan divide. Um, so I wish it was just the case that people's uh, beliefs about the environment were functions of, you know, literally what they could see, um, but it's not, it's emotional, um, it's, uh, you know, uh, political um, and definitely complicated, right? It, it is subject to cognitive biases as well. And I guess my thought on this, building on, um, uh, on Kenworthy's thoughts, as I so often do, um, my thought on this is that it is complicated and certainly the, the crystal ball that we have is, I hope it's a little bit clearer uh, because we've injected some psychology into it, but gosh, it was so, it was so cloudy to begin with, you know, we, we were getting, we can make a couple of, of um, we can make a couple of guesses about what we're glimpsing in there. Um, but um, I, it's difficult to predict these things, but at the same time, I think a few kind of optimistic points I might make, um, uh, because I do in this uh, sort of optimism versus pessimism uh, uh, conversation we've been having, I, um, I, I insist uh, on being uh, an optimist for, uh, for reasons that <laughs> Richard emphasized. Um, a few optimistic points. So one is, one of the things that we found again and again um, is that, you know, people minimize um, harm when the harm looks to be too great or when they um, think that they themselves may have a responsibility. And that comes in a sense from a, something good about people, which is that they don't like to harm others and they don't want to destroy the environment and they don't want the world to be worse because of them. And, and those kinds of intuitions are positive things. I mean, those are those are lovely things about, about people. And I also think that they're lovely things about people um, that, that can lead to actually quite quick shifts in public activities and in values and in um, approaches to emerging environmental problems. So I think as we continue to develop better and better technological and social methods for dealing with some of the really hard problems, including climate change that we've been talking about, I think we could get relatively quick public shifts in support um, for those solutions as they seem to be, um, uh, as they seem more and more possible, and as they give people more and more basically license to recognize, oh, there is a serious problem here. Um, uh, even if I was part of it, I, um, I can now recognize that in a different way once I know that there's a potential solution on the other side of things. And so in, in that sense, I guess it takes me to, um, uh, to, uh, to Tom's important call for, um, for more work uh, at, at, um, in, in, in universities and in, um, in academic communities in general. Um, but it makes me optimistic that as people have better and better ideas about how to manage pollution control and biodiversity loss and even climate change, that in some senses at least, um, uh, it's possible to, um, to make those solutions and then to have people brought along to find the mechanisms uh, to persuade them or to show them or to help them um, overcome some of the challenges that they will other ha otherwise have in perceiving um, and processing uh, environmental uh, injuries. So uh, we actually, we've got a couple questions in the queue, but we're, we're pretty much at the top of the hour. So um, before I stop, I just want to so th thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us. It's always good to see everyone, even in this remote technological environment, which hopefully is ending soon. Um, Arden Kenworthy, 
last words? Just Any genuine gratitude for your being here. And, um, you know, I, I did read Nikki's question. Um, hopefully there are ideas in there for how, you know, we can convince people who aren't convinced. Um, of course, those also mean that there are ideas for unconvincing people who are convinced. So, you know, which are you, an optimist or a pessimist? Pardon? Um, just thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jen, uh, for putting this together. Thank you, Hajin, Richard, uh, and Tom. And uh, thanks always, um, Ben Worthy. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>